final chomp before the chop? What would you eat? The guillotine was a swift and effective form of the death penalty. No mess like the gas proof to be in the United States. Today we're going to peer into the life of one completely vile man and what he requested as his last meal. A hundred points if you can guess right now. A clue? He was from Germany. Peter Curtin. I'm telling you now, after watching this, you can actually go and see this absolute evil beast of a person, as his head is currently on display at a Ripley's Believe It or Not museum in Wisconsin. This guy was one of the worst. Reading about him was stomach churning. and makes you realize there are predators all around us. Peter Curtin was born in May 1883. He was the oldest of 13 children, and his parents were alcoholics. His father was a monster from your nightmares. The family all lived in a one-bedroom apartment where his reign of terror had this family in a vice. Not only were the children beaten, but they were also abused by him. The poor mother was a victim herself, unable to protect herself or her children, so she drank her days and nights away. That was until the attention was turned onto her 13-year-old daughter. She'd had enough, and she got the police involved. Peter's father went to prison for 18 months for his crimes, during which his mother obtained a separation order and left to eventually remarry. From a young age, Peter only knew a twisted version of love and violence. He would often run away or refuse to go home after school because he knew what would be waiting for him when he got home. His schooling would suffer, and although he was a good student, he would find himself unable to continue. Spending time on the streets, he picked up petty theft survival skills and made some new friends in the criminal world. Later in life, he claimed that when he was barely nine years old, he ended the lives of two young school friends swimming in the river. From a very young age, he had chosen to walk a dark path in life. Around this time, he befriended a local dog catcher who taught an already evil child more tricks. What happened from here on out is the stuff of horror films. Peter was constantly in trouble with the law, theft, violence, and forgery. He was in and out of prison until being conscripted in 1904, but showing no respect to authority, he simply deserted the army while committing arson along the way. 1921. After yet another stint in prison, Peter went to live with his sister in Altenburg. This is where he actually got a real job, got involved with the union, and fell in love with one of her friends, Augusta Scharf. Augusta owned a sweet shop, but was actually a former prostitute who had been convicted of shooting her fiancé. They hit it off, they were married, and headed back to Dusseldorf. You would think Peter, now married, would begin a new life with his wife, but old habits die hard, and he was soon having affairs and continuing with his horrific nighttime activities. As he aged, he did not mature, he simply refined his skills. He was unable to contain the dark beast inside him. Peter's nickname, the Vampire of Dusseldorf, would instill fear and emotional pain to many families for nearly 20 years. We all know what vampires are portrayed to do, and with many of his victims, Peter certainly acted like one. 1913 was the first official victim that he was charged for, a burglary gone wrong. A young German girl by the name of Christine Klein. She was simply asleep upstairs in the tavern that Peter decided to rob. It was a violent scene, and one that he would repeat in homes around the city. Women walking home. Men working. Maids or even young orphan girls at a fairground. He took pleasure in all of it. Peter wanted to keep the police on their toes, so after a while he had to change his methods. Moving through various weapons, from knives to hammers. Some victims were simply injured and managed to survive the ordeal, but often remembered little about their attacker. One such victim was an elderly lady called Apollonia. In February 1929, walking by the river, she was suddenly grabbed by the lapels of her jacket by an unknown man who pushed her into some bushes and assaulted her with a sharp weapon. Thankfully, she survived, but was unable to identify him. Over the course of that year, there were many women that did not escape. It was in 1930 when one attack gone wrong would prove to provide the missing pieces for the police. By now, the police were creating a profile of the man who was terrorizing their city. He'd been pretty cocky, sending them letters describing where there were hidden graves. 
A cartographer and analysts figured out it was one man using various weapons and methods to strike fear into the city. In 1929, after running an article about the hand-drawn maps, over 13,000 letters were sent to the police as leads. The police then chased down and interviewed over 9,000 people and had a list of up to 900,000 names to work through. With this huge workload and desperation to break this case, it all came down to a chance meeting in a park with a woman that had just arrived in Dusseldorf. The woman's name was Gertrude Albermont. Peter helped her out of a situation in a dark park from the clutches of another unsavory man under the false pretenses of being her savior. Then he tried to lead her back to his house under the guise of having dinner so he could assault her. However, she didn't go. Instead, they went to a hotel for food. Then he led her to some woods and attempted to strangle her. She started screaming and for some reason, he let her go. Gertrude never went to the police about this. Instead, she wrote to her friend about the horrible attack that she had suffered after just moving to this new city. By a twist of fate, she had written incorrect postage details, so the postmaster opened the letter to see who it belonged to. Upon reading about her attack, he sent it to the police. The authorities tracked her down and then asked her who this man was and where he lived. Of course, she could even point out his landlady who confirmed his name was Peter Curtin. This proved to be the beginning of the end of the reign of the Vampire of Dusseldorf. Peter ran when seeing the police at his house. He remained in hiding for about a week, but came home and confessed to his wife and told her she should turn him in to receive the reward money. In a strange way, he actually wanted the best for her even though he had treated other women terribly. Once in custody, Peter confessed to his depraved crimes. During the trial, it was proven he was sane and in full control of his mind. He maintained composure and explained that some of his crimes were actually premeditated. He also shared how he went back to the secret graves for his enjoyment. The trial lasted 10 days. The verdict was decided in less than two hours. He was charged with nine counts of murder and seven counts of attempted murder. Only Peter Curtin knew the true death count. By the end of the trial, it was noted that Peter had come to some understanding of the horrific nature of his crimes. Taking away the passion and physical ecstasy he felt during them, he now saw, in the cold light of day, his crimes as being so ghastly that he did not want to make any sort of excuse for them. After his sentencing, Peter was allowed, by the judge, to write letters of apologies to his victims, and also a farewell letter to his wife. After a life of creating death, it appears that he wasn't so keen to experience it himself and appealed the sentence. This appeal was denied. His last meal was a pretty big one, a very German meal. A bottle of white wine, Wiener Schnitzel, plus a helping of fried potatoes. He consumed this very quickly, so the guards on duty allowed him a second helping. The next morning, July 2nd at 6 a.m., Peter met his end at the guillotine. For a man who had so much blood on his hands, he found it fascinating that his body's last act would be to bleed as well. He even asked the executioner if he would be able to hear the blood after the guillotine had fallen. The response was no. After his death, doctors took his body and had it mummified. They wanted to study his brain and see what could possibly have caused this man to live a life as he did. They found nothing physically wrong with him to explain the evil choices he made. Peter Curtin did open up to a Dr. Carl Berg before his trial, and many physiological studies about him have been done since 1931. Be prepared to go down a very dark rabbit hole if you decide to read up on this guy. Come back for more Bizarre Last Meals and check out our other videos. Thanks for watching.